Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jackie Harunian, and on behalf of the Law and Banking Committee of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce, uh, we are co-sponsoring co today's program with the Family Business Committee. Uh, I want to thank my co-chair, Paul Harrison of Chase Bank, and also thank uh, Jeff Gross and Tom Gretsch of the Chamber for allowing us to put on this presentation today on a most interesting topic. And I will now um, introduce uh, Judge Jeffrey Leibowitz, who is going to moderate the program today. It's very nice, not yet. You're good, Judge, go ahead. All right, this is, uh, thank you very much, Jackie. And I also wanna thank the Chamber and Jeff Gross, who's been so instrumental in putting this together. Uh, we have a really distinguished panel. Uh, I could take 10 minutes just to go through each of their resumes, but we don't have time for that. So I'm just going to introduce all of them now in the order in which they're going to speak. We have with us uh, Mr. Frank Bruno, and Frank is uh, uh, the principal attorney in the law offices of Frank Bruno Jr. Frank engages in elder law, estate planning, guardianship, probate, and does his fair share of match uh, family law and matrimonial practice. Frank is uh, very well known to the judges throughout Queens County, who many of them, including myself, have often appointed Frank to be the attorney for the children because he's always very fair and reasonable and does, and does the best he can in representing kids that are maybe as young as five or six years old, not an easy task. And I'm also pleased to announce and uh, present to you, Mr. Uh, Sam Farrar. Sam is the... Uh, uh, executive partner at the firm I happen to work at as well, uh, Abrams Fensterman. Sam is also um, the head of the matrimonial department. He's a fellow in the American Academy of Matrimonials, which is a very high honor and not easy to get. He was named one of the 10 leaders in family law. He's been designated as a New York super lawyer since 2008, uh, which I'm told here is a distinction only 5% of the lawyers have in the metro area. He's been in the Best Lawyers of America uh, editions since 2015, and he just finished up uh, two years as chair of the um, Nashville County Bar Family and Matrimonial Committee. It's my pleasure to welcome him. I must go back, and I, I skipped an important part of my introduction of, of, of Mr. Bruno. Mr. Bruno has just become the president of the Queens County Bar Association, and that's in recognition of all of his years of service to improving the justice system for both attorneys and litigants. And then last but not least, you've heard from my friend, Jackie Harunian. Jackie is a name partner in the firm of Whistleman and Harunian. Uh, besides all the work she does as an attorney, she's been named top 50 women lawyers in New York as the only Long Island matrimonial lawyer of that group. Uh, she's written about legal implications of religious divorce, knows, knows a lot about the uh, Jewish divorce and the collateral issues that go with it. But perhaps most importantly, Jackie has done a lot of work with the Safe Center for Homeless and Battered Women, uh, for which she gets no compensation and which, again, to me, is the most important thing a lawyer can do in terms of giving service to the public. So with that brief, and I, and I stress very brief introduction, I'd like to turn this back over to uh, Frank Bruno to begin his presentation. Frank. Thank you for those kind words, Judge. I really appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm, uh, I'd, like to be, I'd like to speak to all of you about estate planning, and I'm gonna intertwine some concepts that are really important for business owners. So why would a business owner want to have an effective state plan or any estate plan? Well, to, I wrote down the two reasons, so I don't forget them. To avoid conflict between family members after your death or even incapacity, and maybe to prevent an incompetent or inept or not fully prepared family member from stepping into your shoes uh, to run the business. So if you think about um, the word, the term estate planning, what is that? Well, it's a plan for your estate, right? Just at a very base level. And what is your plan? Well, we can go through some steps on how you determine that, how you figure that out. But you might want to know what is an estate. 
So I'll start with that very basic term. An estate is all of the things that you own, right? Colloquially, your stuff, your belongings, bank accounts, uh, stock, bond, brokerage accounts, real property, personal property, uh, cryptocurrency, the couch in your home, the dining room set, right? All of the things you own. So shares of stock and shares in your business corporation. So in your plan, you need to figure out what is my succession plan? What is the business succession plan that I need? What would best serve uh, my partners, uh, the business in the short term and in the long term? So that's the overall thought of what an estate plan is. And what are some of the documents within estate planning? There would be, and I'm sure everyone has heard about this, uh, a, a will, a last will and testament. Now you may have heard about it, but probably at least 50% of you on this webinar don't have a will. And I say that because about 50% of all people pass away without a will. 10% say, 10% of the 50%, right? Say, I never wanted to think about death or people die early, right? Young, right? In some tragic event and they never had the opportunity to plan. Um, then people also don't prepare a will or an estate plan because they think they don't have uh, large enough assets. Um, they're uncertain about, you know, maybe they wanna see what's gonna happen with their kids. Maybe they wanna see what's gonna happen with their business. You should plan now, you should plan frequently and you know, revisit the plan at any milestone events in your life. Um, that, would be, that would be a will. Another common estate planning document for the initiated, the people that, those with initiative that want to do that uh, would be a trust. There's a few different flavors of trust. There's a revocable trust. There's an irrevocable trust. But a trust is a very useful document. It's robust. It does everything a will can do but on steroids, it, it's a better, for many people, it's a better product. It's a better option. Uh, I'll tell you the, all of the benefits of a trust in a nutshell. It avoids probate. It's a private document. It's a document that um, doesn't need to go to the court. It does not need to be disseminated to family. So it's private. Uh, it's quick. When we go, let me introduce this concept. When a person passes away owning something, we don't often think about this, but that person's assets are frozen. They're stuck in the name of the deceased person and you can't move, right? You're, so you're, you can't operate your business. You can't uh, take in rent and rental income. You can't pay bills right? unless you have a plan in place. And it doesn't need to be a trust or a will. Maybe it could be a power of attorney. But that being said, the, we want to eliminate that frozen, that, that being stuck in place. And a trust will do that. Uh, the reason for that is a trust is created while a person is living. And it's fully, um, it's, when legally prepared, Right? when correctly utilized, when funded, a trust immediately takes off and is in operation even upon the death of the, uh, the trust maker. Right, So that's a trust. Another important document in estate planning uh, for the young and the old would be a power of attorney. A power of attorney is a document that allows one person to stand in the financial shoes of another person. Very simply stated, it's, it's a little more complicated. June 13th, a new form just went into effect. Um, anybody that has a power of attorney now, and if it was uh, written, drafted before June 13th and properly executed, it's still in effect. But should you do a new uh, power of attorney from today forward, it needs to follow the new guidelines. And they've removed some uh, provisions and inserted others. They've streamlined the process. Um, another important estate planning document would be a healthcare proxy. A healthcare proxy, um, people may be acquainted with it um, in terms of if you go to a hospital for a medical procedure, they might present one to you. 
But if you go to an estate planning attorney or an elder law for focused attorney, you're going to get a healthcare proxy that is a, um, a document that may take into many more, many more things into consideration in terms of uh, testing and follow up. Uh, so you might want to look at, into that and getting a healthcare proxy. And then you have a living will. A living will is uh, inaptly named because it's written while you're alive and it's not a last will. It's called a living will. What that does is it discusses all of the issues related to your death and how to die with dignity, maybe removing yourself from artificial respiration, uh, from mechanical means, right? From keeping you alive past the point. So you make that decision now while you're alive concerning the issues related to your death. So in conjunction, a will or a trust, sometimes both, healthcare proxy, power of attorney, and living will, those are the type of documents that really, uh, as a base plan, most people should have. Now, as business owners, you need some type of succession planning and a buy-sell agreement. I'm not going to speak about that today. Uh, Mr. Farrar is uh, much more capable than me. I've, I've never even drawn up a, a buy-sell agreement, but that is the type of, I advise people to get it. So if you form a corporation or a business, you have a business entity, you should have one. And so that would be helpful. Now, so in an estate plan for a business owner, you should, so if you have a simple business, you might need a simple plan. As your business grows and it's more complex, you may very well need a more complex plan. That's why I say you should plan now, plan early, and then at milestone events, revisit your plan. I'm single, I need one type of plan. I get married, I need another plan. I have children, I need to include the children now. I buy a business, I have to think about what I'm going to do with my uh, shares of stock and who's going to run the business after I'm gone and who do I want to get the business, right? As you get older, you might be confronted with uh, illness or injury or sickness, and you might want to have an incapacity planning, uh, an incapacity plan in place. So if you're single, what would you want to do upon your passing? Would you want the business to be sold? Would you want it to go to your partner? Would you want to purchase an insurance policy now for that purpose? If you have grown children, Say you have three children, A, B, and C. Who's going to get the business? Is it A or B or C, or all three? Is anyone by uh, business skill or acumen able to take over the business? Right. Sometimes you'll see uh, something like uh, father owns a manual labor business. Not exclusively uh, a, a painter or a contractor or a body shop. And the son has been working in the business with the father for 20 years. He's got two siblings. Maybe one's an accountant, uh, one's a doctor, right? Someone has another business. What happens? Is it fair that the child that was working with the father for those years now only owns one third of the business? I don't know. And I will tell you, fair is in the eye of the beholder, right? So whatever you think is fair, <laughs> is what we're going to put in, pa in the paperwork for you. So, <laughs> all right. Um, you need to be realistic about the family dynamics. Um, I often get asked, who should be my executor? Who should be my trustee? Sometimes people default to the oldest child, and that's a relatively fair way to do it. Sometimes you have a situation where there's one in-town kid and there's two out-of-town kids. So, Maybe you, check, you, you choose the in-town kid. Maybe you have someone that one of your children is an accountant or a skilled professional or a business person that has the requisite knowledge. So you make that person your executor or trustee. Um, some people just pick their favorite. What, whatever you want to do, but at least have a reasoned plan for why you picked someone and, and who you pick. Definitely meet with an estate planning attorney. Right, it's a shameless plug, but whether it be me or anyone else, uh, first talk among your family, right? Speak to your loved one, speak to your partner, uh, uh, relationship partner, right? Internally in the home, see what you want to do, what's best for, for your needs. 
and also speak to your business partner and uh, members of uh, you know, trusted friends. So, uh, the one thing that I, I'd, I'd like to end on, I'm, uh, and I'm available for, for questions at the end, along with the panel, is what I'd like you to think about in terms of estate planning is time travel. So we're here now, we're physically strong, we're healthy, we make all of our own decisions. But what happens in the future when we're not quite as strong, not quite as capable, or in fact, when we pass away? We need to think about those things now, uh, slowly, methodically, you know, and in, in, through a process. Thank you very much. Am I just jumping in, Jackie, or do you want to say anything? No, it's your turn next. I just want to remind anyone who's watching that if you have any questions or comments, you can add it to the chat box and we will definitely respond to every question and comments. And we're probably going to save it at the end. Um, but now I'm going to introduce Sam Ferrara, who's going to talk about uh, businesses and shareholder agreements. So there came a point during Frank's presentation where he was about to talk about buy-sell agreements. And I wasn't sure whether to smile and keep quiet or to interrupt him for stepping on my presentation, but he definitely avoided it. Um, and I appreciate that. So Judge Leibowitz introduced me and, and Jackie and I are old friends and old colleagues in that I practice primarily in the area of matrimonial and family law. But as an old matrimonial attorney once told me, and I think Judge Leibowitz may have echoed it to me on one or two occasions, we tend to be you know, a jack of all trades because we touch lots of different areas of the law. And one of the most prevalent that we deal with is when we're talking about closely held or family businesses. And when we talk about that, we talk about general concepts of corporate and transactional law. Early on in the process, when we're meeting with our clients and, and we're talking to you as the business owners, we often ask one very basic question. Do you have corporate formation documents? And most of you look at us as the attorneys and scratch your head and say, what the heck is corporate formation documents? So back in the day when Judge Leibowitz was my age, they used to have these things called corporate kits. And they were a book that the Department of State and the um, the Department of State would trigger your corporate, um, there was a corporate service that would send you, once you pick the name of, a, uh, of your entity, they would send you a book. And inside the book were a bunch of form papers and documents and such, as well as the, the seal that you would need in order to conduct business, open bank accounts, hand out certificates for your shares and whatnot. Not surprising, I think, to many of us on this particular webinar, technology has changed things a bit. Those corporate kits, while they're still out there and you see them on lawyer shelves, and if Judge Leibowitz was really in his office and, and we weren't looking at the library behind him, you would see a lot of lawyers have these corporate kits behind them that show the, the corporate name. Now everything's done you know, virtually and electronically, so you can log into the Department of State website and get a lot of the same information. But what else was in that corporate kit that's important for these discussions? And, and those are what we call the formation documents, not just your receipt to say when you formed the company or in what state or, or who service the process is, but it also contained forms for things like the shareholders agreement and the corporate minutes, which dictated a lot of the information that Frank alluded to and that Jackie will speak to a little bit that we as, as attorneys find incredibly helpful when you're talking about either value or partners coming in or partners coming out or a sale of the business and things of that nature. And when you talk about these formation documents, the shareholders agreement or the membership agreements, a good corporate counsel and a lot of really qualified accountants know this as well, they're gonna tell you that when you form your company, there's a lot of things you need to think about. Among them is what we call the three Ds, right? Death, disability, and dissolution. You can add a fourth in and call it divorce, 
but the divorce can kind of come into that dissolution category as a subcategory. So that when you're forming your, your business entity and you're talking about that, those three Ds, right? Again, death, disability, and dissolution. Inherent in all of those is, is something called corporate succession as well. And what you're looking to do is try and make future conflicts, future problems, business for lawyers. You're trying to minimize all of that, right? If you can do it now, you don't have to pay lawyers and accountants later. And the idea is you want to give some thought. I think, Frank, you know, your closing comment was something that, that I think is incredibly relevant. You've got to jump into the time machine. Right. You're you're forming the corporation or your business entity today, in theory, under the best of all circumstances. Everybody is getting along marvelously. Um, you have a lot of energy and, and optimism and entrepreneurship. But down the road, things change. God forbid somebody gets sick. Somebody becomes incapacitated. Um, there's an accident and somebody gets hurt under any of those. You know, that's that sort of disability category. Then you have you know, God forbid, one of the principles of your business passes away. Are you now stuck in a situation where extended family members are going to become partners in a business they know nothing about? Um, are you stuck with partners that you would never in a million years be partners with? How are you going to extricate yourself or extricate the party who dis who's deceased and their heirs from this business entity? And of course, you have the end line, which is sort of dissolution, which means there comes a reason for some point in time where things are going to disrupt that business entity that you've created, whether it's a sale or the business goes under or there's a partnership dispute. So you have that dissolution category. The corporate succession kind of goes hand in hand with that because under each of those categories, you're looking for what are the next steps and how can you best prepare yourself for that? I have to tell you as a lawyer and, and not giving you a lawyer's answer, there's no black and white answer. There's no cookie cutter here. It depends on the nature of your business. It depends upon the size of your business. It depends upon the players. Is this a family business? Meaning it's brothers and sisters, it's parents and children. Um, is it siblings? Is it, um, you know, cousins? Is it a long standing you know, family tradition, who knows? Is it a couple of guys who met on the golf course or a couple of um, ladies who decided that, you know, they were tired of their current job and they were going to repurpose themselves because of whatever reason? No matter what else um, goes on, you have to understand the different pieces as you're looking at the different options that are available to you. It's important, and I'm just looking at my time here. So it's important that when you're finding these pieces and how they fit, that as, as the principal, you're addressing your own concerns, you're aware of the other principal's concerns, and then you want to do your best, as Frank said, to jump in that time machine and look down the road. Do you get along with your other family members? Do you get along with extended family? What kind of business is it? Is it, you know, a, a more traditional business where um, there's no cash component to it? Every, all the receipts that are coming in are by way of, you know, um, documented means, meaning credit cards, checks, wire transfers, Venmos, that sort of thing. Or is it a cash sensitive business, a laundromat, a car wash, a restaurant, a bakery? When you start to look at those pieces of the puzzle, you have to be sensitive to the implications down the road. What's most important to you? Is it most important that the business continue regardless of one of the three Ds? Or is it the value of the business that's important? How are you going to determine the value of the business? Are you going to have a formal valuation done periodically with the help of your accounting team? Are you gonna use this, what we call a certificate of value? meaning you and the partner sit down once a year and you come to an agreement because you don't want to go through the former evaluate the formal valuation process. You guys just want to sit down and say, hey, listen, if something happens to one of us, you know, my 50% is going to be worth $100, your 
50% is going to be worth $100. And, you know, we can change it by agreement. These are important questions to ask because without corporate documents, a shareholders agreement, a membership agreement, if it's an LLC, you don't want the court or a court to make those determinations. First of all, it's costly. Second of all, it's uncertain. Third of all, it's extraordinarily disruptive to your business if your goal is to keep that business as an ongoing entity. You can never, I think, anticipate all of the potential disputes that might come up between shareholders or between family members. So you wanna do your best to cover the bases as broadly as you can. And one easy way to do that, and it's very funny because we had a, a client come in yesterday who owned a pizzeria and his issue and, and, and his wife is a co-owner of the pizzeria, but they were being um, sued for non-compliance with certain wage and hour requirements. It's very common in the restaurant industry failure to pay overtime, failure to document breaks and lunches. But one of the things that came out during that discussion is how do we as a small, if you'll pardon the expression, mom and pop sort of operation, how do we spend the time and money on compliance issues so that we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's? We're not gonna hire an HR director. We're not gonna pay somebody thousands of dollars a year to make sure our notices are posted and our forms are filled out. And you know, our answer to that is, you're right, you don't have to spend a few thousand dollars a year to make sure you're in compliance. You can now spend tens of thousands of dollars a year on lawyers to get you out of the dispute. I take the opportunity to give you that illustration because it's directly relevant to this issue of corporate compliance, corporate putting everything in its place, if you will, when we're talking about how to plan against the, the inevitable, right? It's a pain in the neck and most of us never think about it. But you know, in that corporate kit I started my discussion about, there are things like forms for annual meetings and designation of officers and directors. Most small businesses never take the time to dot those I's and cross those T's because by definition, you're a small business or you're in business with family members or friends or, or things of that nature. But when a dispute arises, not having those compliance documents can pose an incredible impediment, right? If you're not doing the annual statements and, and making sure that your ownership percentages are, are properly being captured and transacted if you're bringing in more partners or, or getting rid of partners, you wind up in a crazy state of affairs where you're trying to recreate history and gather years worth of evidentiary documents, which might shed some light helping you resolve the conflict. Nowhere is that more true than when we look at the fact that you don't have your compliance documents in order, and yet your tax reporting documents have a lot of information that you think may not be consistent with what your understanding is, right? If you get a K-1 or equivalent, or if you're a subchapter S and you're getting passed through income, that's reflective, generally speaking, of your percentage of ownership in the business. But on my K-1, I might be received, on my K-1, it may say I have 15% of the business, but on the corporate formation documents, which were done 20 years ago, I might still be on the books for 25%. I'm going through a divorce, or I'm going through a contentious dissolution of the business. What's the other side going to say? Do I own 10% or do I own 25%? They're going to argue whatever is most beneficial for them, which is going to cost you time and money. They'll say, oh, no, he's owned 25% the whole time. He takes a bunch out in cash. He's just hung me out to dry. He doesn't want to give me a controlling interest. So he's going to say, oh, no, no, he's limited to the 10% that's on the tax returns. So the more you can plan ahead and the more you can speak with a competent corporate attorney who can raise these questions for you and give you a checklist, the more prepared you are to protect yourself against the three and a half Ds, right? Again, death, disability, dissolution, with divorce being that subcategory of dissolution. 
Again, I'll be available at the conclusion if anybody wants to ask questions, but the key here is don't be afraid to ask questions of the relevant professionals. Jackie. You're muted, Jackie. Oh, sorry. I think there's a question already uh, for, for you, Sam. Judge, do you want to read it out or do you want me to do it? I can do it, Jackie. It says, if death and disability occur, what is the best or easiest method to have liquidity or transfer company value if you are impacted by the 3Ds, getting a bank loan or insurance? So first of all, great question, Ken Maribel, and I appreciate it. Um, death and disability are part of the 3Ds. So that's sort of step one. And when you ask what's the best or easiest method to have liquidity or transfer company value, that's exactly the purpose of this introductory lecture. It's to get business owners to reflect on that. There is no best or easiest method. It's what works for your particular company or your particular entity or your particular ownership structure. What's common, I think, in a lot of businesses that begin to grow and start to plan is they incorporate something which we probably all have seen or heard, something called key man insurance. So in the event of death or disability, the company has purchased an insurance policy, whether it's a life insurance policy or disability policy or some combination, which is designed to provide a fund to compensate either the family of the outgoing partner or to compensate the business so that they can keep going as they're seeking to not let the business fall apart or to compensate the family or the estate of the outgoing partner. So it's, it's a great question. I don't have an easy answer for you because it's what works best for you based on all the different factors we discussed. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Sam. There was a request that we all put our contact information in the chat. So um, I think we should all do that in case there are questions that people want to ask afterwards. Uh, but by way of introduction, again, my name is Jackie Harunian. I'm a partner at Whistleman Harunian and Associates and also co-chair of the Queen's Chamber of Commerce Law and Banking Committee. And I want to thank my co-presenters today when given the opportunity to present on a topic related to family and business owners. Uh, I was really excited by uh, presenting with uh, people that are really the leaders in their field and lead bar associations, uh, Frank leads the Queen's Bar and Sam has been very active in the Nassau Bar. Uh, and Judge Leibowitz is also very, very active in various nonprofits and leadership positions. So it's an honor to be among you. So lawyers, uh, we are the presenters here today and we're lawyers are here to help you. And a lot of times uh, lawyers get a bad rap. Divorce attorneys certainly get a bad rap, but ultimately we're here to prevent all of the chaos and the cost and the disruption that comes when things are not reduced to writing, when you don't put things in writing. And, and Frank uh, talked about estate planning and how uh, risky it is to really just leave things uh, without being resolved among heirs and beneficiaries. And Sam talked about what happens in a business context if you don't put things in writing, if you don't dot the I's and cross the T's uh, when there's uh, the three D's, death and dis disability and divorce. And today I'm gonna to talk to you for a few minutes about what happens in a family context, what happens in marriage, when people that uh, get married presumably love each other, but things break apart and things have not been put in writing, and then you can have very, very chaotic, uh, very emotional, very angry situations where people go to court or go to lawyers and try to get what they think they're due. So the answer to that, uh, very similar to a shareholder agreement or an estate plan, in the context of marriage, there is something that is pretty close to divorce insurance, and, and I'm referring to prenuptial agreements, which are becoming more and more popular. And, uh, you know, 10 years ago or more, there used to be a lot of stigma attached to prenuptial agreements, which are financial agreements you sign before the marriage. You could also do a postnuptial agreement, which is pretty much the exact same thing, but you sign it after the wedding day. But today, um, these types of agreements are not really considered such a big deal. Uh, and especially millennials and young people who are marrying at later ages and have some assets to protect. Uh, they might have their own businesses or startups or stock portfolios these days or Bitcoin. 
they are very willing to sign prenuptial agreements and and uh, they're a very good thing to do even for older couples especially for second marriages if you have children and so I want to talk to you a little bit about how these agreements can really benefit you especially if you're a business owner because almost any financial advisor or accountant you speak to or certainly a matrimonial lawyer they are going to recommend prenuptial agreements if you own a business for all kinds of reasons, which I'm gonna go into now. First of all, the main thing really comes down to psychology and I do have a degree in psychology. Uh, and even though all of us up here on the stage are youngsters and I went to law school with Sam and I've appeared in front of Judge Leibowitz as a young lawyer, uh, we are all still uh, on the young side. So all the ageism jokes we can put aside, but psychology really is the, really the cornerstone of almost all family law disputes. And the basic uh, reality is that when you, before you uh, walk down the aisle with someone, it's probably the best time to reach a fair agreement. It's probably the time where you're the most motivated to be honest and fair. You're gonna put your cards on the table. You must disclose all of your income and assets. A prenuptial agreement can only be held up in court in New York if there's something called full disclosure. And full disclosure means you have to communicate with your partner. And isn't that a great thing to do before you get married? So you're going to disclose your assets. You're going to disclose your debts. You don't want to find out that your partner has student loans uh, when you're already married a few years. You don't want to find out they're on the verge of bankruptcy um, You know, when you're already married. The time to find all that information is before. And a prenuptial agreement requires communication and disclosure. So that's a good thing. In the case of a business owner, a uh, business that's owned prior to the marriage or a real estate entity uh, or real estate partnership or um, patents or intellectual property, anything you own before the marriage is separate property. And a prenuptial agreement gives you the opportunity to list everything you have before the marriage. And so it's on paper and your, your soon to be spouse loves you and can't wait to get married. So they're gonna agree that what you own before the marriage is separate property. And a prenuptial agreement is actually almost like a bridge to estate planning, which Frank talked about before, because you can actually do some estate planning in your prenuptial agreement. And the most common thing is to disinherit your spouse. Uh, and you can always do a will later on and provide for your spouse. But uh, conventionally, when we do prenuptial agreements for a business owner uh, that's about to be married, uh, we declare that the business is separate property, all other assets are separate property. And what that means is in the event there's a divorce, uh, it should never happen. But if it does, that business is off the table. It's it's really not something that can be investigated. You can't subpoena, you know, your, your husband's brother who works in the business. You can't go after the books and records of the business. Um, it really closes that door because the, the spouse is acknowledging that they don't have rights to that business. You can go further and agree that you're not going to support each other. You can waive spousal support, which is a very, very sort of touchy issue in divorce court, uh, usually because expectation doesn't match reality. And so when we're dealing with people and increasingly millennials are both working, uh, both of them are educated for the most part when they're getting married, uh, it's not uh, so difficult as it once was to get both of them to agree, I don't have to support you. We're gonna get divorced and we're gonna go our separate ways. Of course, you can have situations where there's a very, very big disparity in wealth and income and in those situations in high net worth cases with business owners or other types of assets, you are gonna have a negotiation regarding spousal support, but that's okay. It's still better to agree on it before rather than wait until the marriage ends and everyone's angry and then suddenly you're gonna have a battle on your hands regarding spousal support. Other things that a, a prenuptial agreement um, can, can provide for that really eliminate a lot of conflict is what happens if the parties buy a house together, together? What if you borrow money from a business to buy a house together? How does that impact the business and what does that mean for, this, for the parties when they get divorced? A prenuptial agreement is going to very clearly spell out that if the parties buy a house together and the funds to buy the house came from one side or the other or a business or a family member, well then that down payment or contribution is gonna go back to that party. And that's fair and, and that is right. And usually people that aren't married yet wanna do the right thing and they will agree to that. If we borrow money to buy a house, of course that money should go back to where it came from. 
Uh, if you don't have a, a, a prenuptial agreement or a postnuptial agreement, everything I just talked about can get very, very messy. There's something in matrimonial law in New York called commingling, uh, you know, where if you buy a house uh, and you don't say where the down payment came from and you put your spouse's name on the house, well, then that suddenly then can be something fought over in a divorce. The same thing in a business. Even if you own your business prior to the marriage, if you let your daughter-in-law or your new wife or other people work in the business, it doesn't just have to be a spouse. Without having things in writing, without having things defined, you are potentially creating a legal batter, battle down the road. Because if the relationship fails, if there's acrimony in the family, suddenly a family business can really become a, a very, very contested litigation. Again, not just in divorce court, it could be other family members. So always attorneys are going to recommend that you keep things friendly, but put things in writing so that in the event things fall apart, you have something to fall back on uh, that's fair and reasonable when, when the communication and the trust was, was there and it was good. Uh, another thing about prenuptial agreements, also a pretty big trend, is that um, young people are agreeing in advance how to deal with uh, religious divorce issues, including the, including the Jewish get. Uh, that can eliminate conflict in a family. People are um, agreeing regarding deaths and gambling deaths and frozen embryos. This is a huge trend in the law which is putting things in writing before you get married. And for a business owner, uh, there is so much uh, reason to do a prenup or a postnup, a lot more than I can go into today. But uh, just so it's clear, what happens if you don't have a prenup? What if you don't have a postnup? And there's either a new business or one that existed before the marriage. Well, because it's so difficult to ascertain what that business is worth, uh, because the, the parties generally are not going to agree on what it's worth. And because a lot of non-titled spouses think they deserve half the business, which in reality, that is nowhere near what they're going to get. The law has really changed so that if you're not really active in a business and you didn't really start the business with your spouse, you're really going to get maybe five or 10 or 15%. It's nowhere near 50%. The law has really changed. But it's because of that psychology again, because of the expectations that people have that don't match the laws that really leads to conflict. If a divorce case goes into the system, goes into court, and they're about to reopen the courts, uh, you know, uh, COVID is, is, is definitely going in the rear window for most of us. We are gonna have more live court appearances. Uh, one of the first things that happens on the very first day of a contested divorce case, if there's a business, is the judge is going to appoint a neutral evaluator of that business, a forensic accountant chosen by the judge. Depending on the size and scope of the business, we're talking about ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 on day one in court required uh, by the court so the judge can investigate what that business is worth. There's a lot of he said and she said that goes on in divorce court in family law matters. Uh, the court has to get the most reliable information about what a business is worth. And there is no judge that's going to make a ruling regarding a business without a neutral report. So think about that. Uh, what this, how high the stakes are if you have a business. And then the neutral expert six months later is gonna come up with a report that no one's gonna agree with. The husband's attorney is gonna challenge it with his own expert. The wife's attorney is going to choose her own expert. And then you have set the stage for a battle that can last two to three years, if not longer. I know I've been involved in litigation that's, uh, you know, even close to five years. I'm sure Sam and, and Frank and Jeff, you know what I'm talking about. It, it is a nightmare scenario. So let's go back to the times of love and romance before the marriage started. Everyone is motivated to be fair. The business owner potentially can get something signed by his fiance that you're not gonna make claims to my business. Uh, maybe they'll agree that if the business grows in value, she'll get 10% or 15%. These are the discussions that need to be had. They're not always the most comfortable discussions. Sometimes it takes a lot of courage. These can be difficult. However, uh, as you can tell, I'm a big proponent of communication, of being fair, uh, open up, opening up these discussions and finding out what you need to know before you get married definitely leads to a happier marriage. And one last thing is you need to have an attorney. There has to be an attorney on both sides when you sign a financial agreement. 
There has to be an attorney for both parties. It can't be signed, uh, you know, a day or two before the wedding day. You should really negotiate it a few weeks or a few months in advance if possible. These are some of the safeguards um, when we're uh, negotiating prenuptial agreements or postnuptial agreements. And I think I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Jackie. We actually in, uh, have a question from another, from another member of uh, our group and I'm gonna read it and it, I think, We'll start with uh, Frank and then Sam, if you want to weigh in. And Jackie does her own share of uh, estate work. So again, it's from Ken uh, Maribel. So uh, if I want to do a trust to avoid probate and a family feud, but have no family I trust or other person that will handle your affairs, which is not an unusual cir circumstance, what should you do? Who should be the executor or trustee? I'll start with uh, Frank on that. Excellent question. It's an often asked question. <clears throat> I don't have an easy answer. There, there, you can have a corporate trustee, right? A, a bank, a financial institution, depending on how sizable your estate. But when I'm presented with this question, and, and I do get this question a lot by uh, clients and prospective clients, I try and in a, in a dialogue, I work through who they could possibly use. Would it be, you said you have no family or that you trust. The, um, do you have a, a niece or nephew that may be a little, you know, be close to the age of majority? They have to be over 18. Realistically, you want them to be 25 or 30, right? For um, j just the sense of life experience. And, but I look for people in the family um, either it's got to be the person you trust the most. So right, right there within your question, you presented me a, a conundrum that I can't answer. Uh, but I, I do ask people to look at um, someone with the skill or acumen, someone in the, that's intelligent, uh, nice personality, able to get along with other relatives. Just have to wrestle with that question internally. Uh, maybe a trusted friend, a person you went to high school with, you know, my mom had uh, some friends that she had for, you know, more than 40 years. They weren't high school friends, but they met her early in life. And I mean, my mother could have relied on one of those trusted friends. So it doesn't have to be a family member, but it does need to be someone that you trust. Frank, uh, Sam, you want to add to that? Without sort of restating what Frank said, you know, all of that is accurate. We often in matrimonials, we have to find a trustee that's not, you know, the husband or the wife and in corporate disputes when, you know, one side or the other doesn't agree. Oftentimes we'll, we'll reach out to a financial professional or somebody that, you know, a party may trust or some sort of a neutral institutional person. Um, obviously it's not gonna be us as the attorneys, um, but, you know, we try and encourage the, the folks who want the trust to consider other, other trusted options, maybe an accountant, um, you know, their money manager, somebody like that. I, I, I know this was touched on a little bit, but my question is probably a lot of people in our, in our viewing audience are successful businessmen, hardworking, uh, entrepreneurial, but they seem to lack vision when it comes to their own personal affairs till, as Jackie pointed out, it's a little too late. So I would ask, uh, starting with uh, Sam, how can, what can you tell our audience what they really need to know and what they really need to do despite their hesitancy to plan for the future? Sorry, it's not an easy question, which, you know, isn't very nice of Judge Leibowitz, who's supposed to work with me every day, to pitch to me first. But putting that aside, um, you know, highlighting for folks our experience in dealing with what happens when you don't do it, you hope that it will scare them into taking action a little bit. Um, and, you know, it, it's a it's a tough situation. You're going to scare them in a couple of different ways, right? You're going to scare them that you may wind up with partners you don't want. You may wind up with your business getting sold out from under you. You may wind up spending, you know, more money in legal fees than you're going to, you know, profit over the next couple of years. 
but you know, without it, you can easily illustrate to them the pitfalls. And I think that's, you know, that's the easiest and most effective way. And then, you know, what we do oftentimes here is we will, for our corporate clients, we will tickle our system so that we send them out a reminder periodically to update their documents, whether it's, you know, the annual meeting, the shareholder certificates, or sometimes it's just to um, make sure that they're in compliance with all of the rest of the corporate situation. Thanks, Tim. Frank, you want to add anything to that? He's good. Jackie, you want to add anything to that? I, I would add that I think it brings a lot of peace of mind to take care of these things. I think a lot of times people procrastinate. They don't want to deal with these types of documents or make these types of decisions. But if they do, they will find a lot of relief that comes from, you know, putting your affairs in order. I know when I signed, I had children very young. I was a young mom. And when I signed my will with my husband in our early 30s, I just felt more at peace every time I got on a plane or I wasn't with my children. I just felt like if God forbid anything happened, uh, they would be okay. And I really think you really have to think beyond yourself and just think what is the worst case scenario and, and don't I want to do the right thing by my loved ones? Um, I, I, the other thing is wills can be changed. You can sign a will and you can change it. You know, you can do business agreements and still retain some control over your assets and, and the, the functioning of a company. Um, you know, you do have to let go of a little bit of control sometimes if you're gonna bring in new partners or share uh, some of the roles, but there is relief and peace of mind. You do have to start with a trusted advisor. Uh, and, and, and generally speaking, attorneys, uh, we've seen the worst case scenarios play out. We know what happens when things are not provided for. And, and again, despite the bad reputation that some attorneys have, we really are looking out for our clients. We're trying to prevent them from making mistakes that will really rip apart their families and businesses. Since, since we're on the screen with Jackie to begin with, uh, let me ask you this, Jackie. Uh, can you talk a little bit about prenups, not so much for the, for the business owner or the father or the patriarch or the matriarch of the family, when, when a child gets married and now there's an in-law brought into, into the business or at least into the family, can you, can you explain why a prenup is important for the children, not just for the person who owns the property? Yeah, I mean, a prenup, you're talking about if there's adult children already in the picture right. Right. and there's a prenup. Like I mentioned before, a prenup, you can disinherit your new spouse. Uh, you know, if it's a new relationship, if you have children from a first relationship, uh, you want to protect them, right? Because they're the ones that need uh, protection, or maybe you want to provide for them, and then later on provide for your new spouse. So in a prenuptial agreement, as I mentioned, you can completely disinherit your brand new spouse, you can get life insurance if you want to provide for support obligations, but you're then preserving the estate that you have on your wedding day for your children. Um, that, you know, you had always intended to provide for. And if you do these things, you're going to create more family harmony because your children are not going to resent your new spouse. They're provided for, uh, you know, uh, you can reassure them that they haven't been uh, somehow um, undermined by the new marriage. And, and this is something important because it creates a lot of conflict in families and, and people are living longer. And we do have no fault divorce. And lots of times people want to move on with their lives and get remarried. And uh, they're hesitant because they're afraid of divorce, which is really something to be afraid of, as I mentioned before. But a prenuptial agreement can really, really smooth things out, protect everyone it needs to protect, and, and, and prevent that worst case scenario. Uh, there was a question regarding disclosure and, and what happens if there isn't full disclosure. And so I, I want to address that. As I said, uh, having an attorney not signing the prenup too close to the wedding day. And the third thing is disclosure. These are mandatory aspects of a prenup. And if you don't have it, it can be set aside in court. And what's the point of doing a prenup unless it holds up in court? So full disclosure really means you've gotta be open and honest about all of your sources of income and all of the assets and debts in your name. Uh, you don't have to have it down to the penny. You don't have to like produce bank statements necessarily. You have to come up with a list that's reasonably accurate. Uh, sometimes it's off uh, a little bit. If it's off a little bit, it's not going to necessarily affect the outcome of, of, of the uh, document or whether it'll hold up in court. But if you're fraudulent, if you don't disclose, if you're deliberately not sharing the information that's going to impact the other party, then you're really creating um, a loophole that might uh, really make the prenup worthless or at least subject to challenge in court. So if you're going to do it, do it the right way. 
be open and honest in your relationships. Um, and if you need to uh, sign a postnup, then open up a discussion about that. I have seen postnups save marriages. A lot of times people, especially an older couple, might start to fight about things, maybe fight about business debt or about the fact that one party wants to, uh, you know, cash in a 401k or other financial decisions. People do fight and, and you can sit down with an attorney, do a postnuptial agreement, address where that money is coming from and what happens in the event of a divorce and, and you will save the relationship or at the very least take away a lot of the animosity. So uh, lots of good reasons to do these types of agreements. I think Jackie makes an excellent point. Actually, she's made a number of excellent points to today, and I hope everybody's listening. Um, but unlike contracts you might sign in business, prenuptial uh, agreements are under much more scrutiny. And there's a greater likelihood that they could be set aside for some of the reasons that Jackie discussed. So I would urge all of you, if you're doing a prenup for yourself or you're doing it for one of your children who's about to get married and you're concerned about the succession plans that, that Sam talked about, that you make sure it's done with a lawyer. You cannot do it on a piece of paper the day before the marriage. You need to have a lawyer look at it. And you also have to have the person who's signing and have a lawyer look at it. But you would be surprised how many prenuptial agreements are set aside. So please be very uh, careful with that. I have one last question. I know we're running out of time. I don't know, Jeff, do we have time for one? I have one more question or not? Yes. Okay. So my question here is, we've been talking about divorce a lot and Jackie's right. It's not an easy event. I mean, you could not be with a person for 30 years. And even when that time comes when you get divorced, it's still an emotional experience. My question is this, we're, we're dealing with the chamber here. There's a lot of successful business people here. But there's also a lot of second marriages. And then we come up with the situation where the stepmother is not the mother of the business owner's children or stepfather business owner's children. So I'll continue with Jackie on this. How, how do we deal with that when, if there is no agreement, the new wife or the new husband will get, will pretty much get, or get a lot of the, depending on the will or lack of one, will get a lot of the assets. How do we deal with this new reality? Well, I mean, it, it's very messy. Really what it, what it creates, a situation with a business and no prenup is a messy situation if there's anger on both sides. So in, in the situation you describe, a successful business owner gets remarried for the second time and has adult children, doesn't sign a prenup, and then five years later is facing a divorce with his second wife. Now, during that five-year period, if the business appreciated in value, if, it's not, if it has more lo locations, if it has more employees, if the revenue, uh, the bottom line revenue is higher than on the wedding day, that's a problem. That's a situation where uh, they better lawyer up fast and try to have a reasonable discussion about what she might be entitled to. Or like I said, if it goes into court, there's going to be a forensic expert appointed. And during those five years, if the business went up in value, she is going to get something. Like I said, it could be a very small percentage. She's not going to get half the business or anything close to it. Uh, the same thing with a piece of real estate. Any asset that goes up in value during a marriage is on the table, even if the one party owned it before the marriage. And, and it could be a very small amount of money. But that's not really the point. When you're furious at your spouse, when you're angry at a betrayal, when you have nothing to lose and you're really like not thinking rationally, you will go ahead and burn through 10, 20,000 illegal fees, even if it means you're not going to net anything at the end. And that's dangerous. And that's not anything we can really do anything about except to uh, try to find a way to put things in writing uh, before it gets to that point. I I've seen situations where the business owner will keep his wife uh, on the cell phone or maybe provide medical insurance for a little bit longer or maybe give her some sort of um, financial arrangement, consulting. There's ways to do it. That's not quite as painful, but still, uh, you're leaving yourself open for a lot of risk. I, I think we run to two o'clock and we're on, we're trying, I don't want to ask any more questions. I want to, again, thank the uh, chamber. I want to thank Jeff Gross, Tom Grish, uh, of course, Jackie is the chair of our committee and, and Sam and uh, Frank. The, I will tell you just, I won't say anything about myself, but these are wonderful lawyers. And whether you could someday need them or somebody else, please take to heart everything that was said. There was some very important things there. With that, we're gonna say good, good
good afternoon for the day and look forward to seeing you again in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeff.